Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to day 13, New Africa, August. We're here for Let's Chat, Education Part 2. Um, our moderator for today is Ms. Rhonda Walker. She's an Emmy Award winning life coach on NBC Starting Over, a mental health therapist and a wellness coach, an HU graduate, as well as Temple University. She's a lecturer nationally and internationally on wellness for over 25 years. Okay, Rhonda, take it away. Hi, everybody. So I'm gonna introduce our two panelists and hopefully our third will be able to come on. She was with us last time, um, Ms. Kimberly Lewis, but as a Pew educator, as Akia said earlier, she is actually still working, so. You know how that happens. Things don't always go according to our time plan, our time frame. So let's start with Zakia. Could you wave your hand? Hi, how are you? Everybody. Zakia Abdul Salam has transformed into a reflective educator who continues to seek knowledge, to share, and develop students into caring human beings that reflects their best selves. She has provided student instruction, educational leadership and support to middle through high school students and staff members during her 30 year run in education. Zakia worked as a founder and catalyst for change at Kitt Philadelphia Prep Academy, Kitt Du Bois Collegiate Academy, both in Philadelphia, Eastside Charter School in Wilmington, Delaware, the School District of Philadelphia, Clara Muhammad School, the Village Learning PCS in Washington, DC, and the list is endless. She is a proud, proud, proud graduate of Howard University and Bank Street College of Education. Zakia <clears throat> officially started her work in education as a member of the Charter Corps of Teach for America in New York. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so happy to see your smiling face again. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Now we have Mrs. Tamika Michelle Evans, and she is an educator and has been over the past 18 years as an educator for the School District of Philadelphia. In 13 of those years, she served as an administrator. Um, well, she's still an administrator of the Global Leadership Academy Charter School. Now, what I just found out the other day is that there are actually two locations. So that was new information. So thank you for telling me that. She is a CEO, principal of Global Leadership Academy Southwest where she is dedicating her talents to turning around a failing Renaissance school. Tamika's dedication to the scholars and staff of GLA has not come without sacrifice. But you will often hear her say, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. GLA is not work to Mrs. Evans. It is her passion and it is what she believes is her calling. She graduated from Temple undergrad and a master's degree in educational administration and principal certification from Gwinnett Mer Mercy University. And she comes from a family of educators, so this is all new for her. And she knew that she was destined to become a teacher. The last thing I wanna mention is that she founded the Reading Corner Cafe in 2017, which is an after-school program based in North Philadelphia, the brewery town section, and provides children with the joy of reading and believes that every child should find joy in reading and wants to bring that joy back. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome to you, Tamika. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be here this evening. So in that same vein, as um, a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Tamika, I know you are really stoked right now about <laughs> Kamala Harris, right? Yes, excited. And very excited. And then um, for Zakia and Kim, who's not here myself, she's Thank a teacher grad. So we're doubly, doubly excited about yes. that. Yes. So we get a twofer in the room, which is nice. So I was just thinking about that because, you know, of course, there are tons of articles going around and that I didn't know. I knew Shirley Chisholm ran for president. A lot of people know that. She's actually my sore on Delta. So she, I knew that, but there are 12 women who actually ran for president, African-American women who ran for president. I was like, whoa, I just found that out yesterday. So um, if you get a chance, maybe check that out and see, um, you know, check out who these women are. So I thought that was really interesting. So I know she's, you know, up for VP, but of course the next logical step for her would be president. So just an extra shout out to her, really excited for um, what the future is holding for African-American women. And then when I think about 
us as African American women in education, what does that look like and what does that mean? So I wanted to start out with something I was talking to Zakia about, which was people who are dealing, who are qualified. So people who are qualified have the knowledge and know what they're doing, but still fall into the imposter syndrome. So I just wanted to touch on that and to see if either one of you, um, I'll start with Tamika, has experienced that. And if so, how did you try to mitigate it? So knowing that fear and doubt, all of this goes along with just being alive and being human, but knowing that you're well-equipped, well-educated, you've done the work for a long time, but do you ever fall into the trap of imposter syndrome? So I definitely think that um, being, uh, bl being black, being a woman, um, walking into a predominantly male-dominated administrative pool um, has definitely allowed that to kind of come into my purview, I guess, um, over the years. Um, when you are looking at education as a whole, a lot of times you look at it and it is predominantly white women. But then when you get to the administrative level, it is white men. And mm -hmm. so um, in, this, um, in this vein, I think that, you know, we still are dealing with ideas of are you really qualified for this? Did you really receive the position because you were qualified and you were ready? Um, are we really still making, you know, 77 cents on a dollar to the, you know, to a mill that's uh, actually getting this position as well? So there are a lot of things that I think go into um, this idea of are you qualified because there are people that certify that's not qualified. Um, there are people who can pass a test that are just not qualified to teach black and brown children. Um, and so um, I think that for us, um, for me personally, I have definitely felt um, that idea of being in a room where there are not many black women that are sitting in this position. And so you are feeling like, you know what, how did I get here? You know, I know I'm qualified. I know I can do the job, but then, you know, or how are others um, observing me? Exactly, exactly. And I just want to jump in really quickly um, because what you just said, today is actually equal pay day for African-American women. And so something I just learned out, learned about yesterday. So basically what it does is you look into how far into the year, so 2020, that it took African-American women to catch up to white men in terms of what they earned last year. And so I think for white women, it's 77 cents in, to the dollar. For us, it's 62 cents to, to the dollar. Thank you. So yeah, it's very interesting. And so um, Zakia, as you answer this question about imposter syndrome, you might want to touch on what um, Tamika said about um, inequity in terms of pay interesting because uh i i wasn't aware when i first when i initially became uh an administrator but what i did believe was that i wanted a fair salary and so that was where i initially tried to negotiate my salary so when when founding um and becoming the founding assistant principal i said i'm not gonna let someone choose me I'm going to choose them mm -hmm. and so when I made this decision to come into administration I really never wanted it but I believe that the community of people will elevate you as such mm -hmm. so because other parents and and people in the community thought that this was something that would be beneficial that helped me in my decision but when making that decision, I really was adamant about negotiating. And that's when I found out as I did this research that everybody, men were just being paid astronomically different. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just stuck to it. And I'm sure that it wasn't what the men in my same situation were getting, were getting paid, mm -hmm. but I believe that it was more than what it would have been had I not pushed. So I say that to say, just always push and always know that you have the right to negotiate right. and be ready for the fallout because that's where I was. Mm -hmm. I was ready for what would not happen if I didn't get it. That's right. um, I also think when, when you're in the room, this has happened to me recently. Mm -hmm. I have decided that if in fact 
right now I'm trying to research to find out where is there a school district? Where is there a network of schools where 80% of the children are African American and 80% of them are at a proficient level? So if the numbers run at 30 and 40% with 80% of someone else leading and teaching our children, then we don't, that's, that's not, I, I can do it. If you're going to mess up for them, I can mess up for them. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be a mess up. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not going to be, if they're not going to get what they're supposed to get. So, um, and that was my recent situation. Like, I, I just left a situation like that where I knew that the person coming in was male. I knew that they were Caucasian. I knew that they were going to take on this responsibility, but I did not see where what I was capable of doing was any less than what he was going to do. Right. And so I think that's where we are in our schooling. Like we have to decide that, you know what? No, it doesn't matter. Like I so, get to let me, excuse me. Let me just take you back for a moment. So, um, can you still speak to the imposter syndrome? Have you experienced that? And if so, how did you handle it? How did you get yourself back together? Say, say more about the imposter syndrome. Help me. So, and you may not have experienced it, but for many of us, especially being in environments, um, more diverse environments, I think even more so there's, there's that challenge. When you're in the room, is it because you're in the room because you're qualified and because you, you know what you're bringing to the table? Um, do you know that? Or do you think others don't know that about you? Or do you allow that to play into your psyche? So how do you deal with that in terms of being there, being qualified, knowing what you know, but still second guessing yourself? Yeah. So when I just spoke of the situation that I said I just left, that mm -hmm. was it. That was probably my first experience with it. And I began to question myself whether or not this other person coming in with this particular skill set, whether or not what my skill set, my skill set was different, mm -hmm. but I believe my skill set was what our children needed. Right. As the leadership in their maleness had decided was something else that was necessary. And so I questioned that. And now that I took that time to step back is why I gave that whole like spill of what I just gave. Like, okay, no, it, even if your skill set is different or if you thought it was better, it hasn't gotten this 80% that I'm looking for. At least a B, I want it. I want that a hundred percent. Right. But how did you, so for um, some of the people who are here listening, what kind of, tools would you recommend like what kind of tips would you suggest like if you find yourself feeling like an imposter is there like one thing that you did that really helped you to move out of that space and not stay there <laughs> i think uh actually I, I don't know how to say it i'm just i'm gonna shoot it straight just say it I, I touch the boy in the parking lot and say listen we have a philosophical difference mm -hmm. and what i believe and what i do is a very necessary thing and during your time here, you may not get that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not there anymore either. <laughs> right. But you were able to work through it and realize. Oh. Right. But I had to say that for my own sanity. I had to say that for me to get through the rest of the school year, for me to continue to come in there and still have my smile and still be Miss Abdul Salam for the children. Because had I just kept let, it was eating at me. Right. I, I was listening to music and songs that had to pump me up before I got out the car. I can't even name some of those songs. Right. You know? like, right. So that's, that's real. I mean, just being in, um, in, in America and dealing with things when you know what you're bringing to the table, but because of, here's an example, because of your skin color, um, you may be discredited. And sometimes imposter syndrome has to do with, you know, race and sometimes it doesn't. But an example is, um, I just saw it on the uh, front of the Yahoo Mail, I was logging in, and uh, the guy, what's his name? Um, I don't know how to say his name, is Fergraves or something. 
He's a mayor. I just, I took a picture of it so I could mention it because I was on, outdone. Barry Pressgraves, um, the mayor, Lorraine mayor, Barry Pressgraves, um, they're calling for his resignation because he said that Biden just um, chose Aunt Jemima as his running mate. Okay. So it's just, it's just more of the same as, as we delve into that and knowing that this woman could probably run circles around this man. So just having to deal with that. So being able to reclaim your power and to decide how you're going to um, experience yourself in the world, no matter what someone else is telling you. Um, to me, what, what yeah, like um, I think that because we're like, even in this idea of education, this is why it's so important that our children know who they are. Um, this is why it's so important that we teach our children who they are, that we don't allow others to define who they are, um, that in our households and in the village, that we're the ones that's pumping them up, as you said, Zakia, like you're, we're the ones so that, you know, we, we are affirming them. We're sending them out of our houses in the morning already affirmed for who they are. We're already telling them that they're great and that there's greatness within them because others will make you feel as if you don't belong. And so um, even in the situation that we're dealing in, right now this whole whether or not she's qualified she can run circles around everybody that's on that stage and everybody that is has come before her but i wrote this yesterday on one of my facebook pages it is our time we have to protect her and that's the bottom line it is our job and our obligation to protect her right now because at the end of the day they will rake her over the coals because they want to show that she's not qualified to be there and we know that she is more than qualified more than qualified to be there and she would not be there if she was not but i do agree with you that sometimes we get in these uh situations and we ourselves start to doubt our own selves and we doubt our own selves because of what the naysayers around us start to say and so this is why even for our young children that we educate each and every day it is our job every day when we walk up my children walk out of here i tell them what's your last name it's evans what does that mean you're an evans you don't accept anything less every day i have to speak greatness into them because if i don't do it somebody's going to say something that's going to negate what i said in my house earlier that morning to them so it is imperative that we that our children know who they really are and understand who they really are in order for this not to be something that becomes uh, prevalent in their lives okay so um that was thank you that was that was really well said so one of the things i just saw in the chat is um the reference of african-american men needing to step up and in that vein i just want to ask you and i know tamika you're married um and zakia was married so in your role as a leader, as leaders, how has that played out? Um, and maybe in your marriage or maybe outside of your marriage, how has that played out in, in terms of your interactions with black men? How, do, how does that look and how does it feel? Mm -hmm. Let me go. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, I, so in my household, um, I have a strong um, black man as a husband who um, is a very is very clear about where he stands on you know mo on pretty much every issue. Um, I don't have to worry about those things. But I will say, even in my school as a principal and CEO, uh, my assistant principal who has been with me for the last fourteen years, um, when I tell you that between him and the other black men that are surrounding me in my position. They, they tell me all the time, they say we protect the quarterback all the time. And that means something to me because it means something to me when I walk into a place that others might look at me and try to figure out, okay, this poor 11 woman that's walking in here and these men have my back and it means something. And so for, for that, those small things, it doesn't even mean they know my worth. They know what I come bringing. They, they, they understand that I'm a queen. They, they treat me as such. And then they make sure that others treat me as such. Excellent. So for me, it means a lot when we have men that are, will stand in front of us and ahead of us and will make sure that they're standing so that no one else, so going back to what I said, that they can protect us at all costs. So that's where, you know, but I've had great experiences with Black men and what they do in, our, in my home as well as in my workplace. Excellent. That's really good. Okay, Zakia? Yes, uh, like, just like Tamika, my experience has been- uh, Can you speak strong. a little louder? Sure. My experience has been strong and powerful. Um, I have had uh, the honor of even working with my own brother uh, in a school. 
and um, that that degree of protection and uh, similitude in our ideology and our work uh, was always very clear. Um, and and even my 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 ex husband, like in our in our relationship and in our friendship, when 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 he's needed, it, it is what it is, you know, and it is uh, necessary um, sometimes to to step in a role of protection. So my experience is very similar to uh, Tamika's that um, the men that I have just engaged with in work and in in everyday life, my father, mm-hmm. yeah, that that's just the strength. Okay, so I'm glad you both said that. So we're talking about black men, African American men stepping up and being support systems, you know, throughout your life, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you support yourself? Like, how do you tell yourself I'm a leader and keep going every day? At times when you are exhausted, when no one is there, when you're in a space by yourself, how do you keep going? Is that okay? You want to start? Sure. Um, I have always believed that the the work that I, it was, it was God that chose this path for me. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that is, typically where my my strength comes from when I feel or believe that um, I'm I'm not where I need to be. Um, I'm prayerful. And so I don't think there's anything more than that, that that, that's my, that's my go-to. That's my first Mm go-to. You know, there's some other things in taking care of myself, trying to uh, be healthy, those kind of things. But like when I really am doubting myself, Mm-hmm. and trying to look for guidance in which way to go that it that's my that's my go-to okay Tamika um I totally agree same thing um I think that for me uh you read it when you read my bio you said that um I believe that this is a calling I don't believe that this is a job I don't believe that um I believe that God called me to um serve in this in this capacity and so and when you have a calling on your life you can get tired in it but you don't get tired of it and I think that the idea is that I get tired in this work because this work is a lot. Right. Um, in this work, and might, in spite of getting tired in it, I'm not tired of it because I do believe that when God has a calling on your life, he will give you that strength that you need to keep going. And so I'm, I'm um, same as Zakia, I just feel like we, I just, I feel like it's a calling. And I feel like each and every, and I also feel like there's a push because every day that I get up, I see something else that makes me say, this is why I have to get up. Because something else comes on the news, comes on Facebook, comes somewhere else that just pisses me off. And I'm like, this is why I got to get up and do this for these black kids. This is why I have to do A, B, and C. So something every day pushes me toward this this level of a calling. Every day I see something else that makes me know that there's a reason that I do this every day. So that was really good that you said that because I was going to say, when you set your intention and when you are focused and you know what your purpose is, there will be road signs along the way. So when you're having those doubts, you're gonna see something or experience something, someone's gonna say something to you. And one of the things I just wanna mention because you know, as a wellness coach, life coach, whatever you want, a mental health therapist, one of the things I find really helpful, I just wanna share, so this may be helpful for someone else. When you're feeling like, oh boy, you know, where am I in my life? You know, even if you're doing the work and you just may feel lost within yourself, even though you're still doing your work, you're doing a great job. What I have um, done for myself and I've recommended to my mom and other family members and just take your resume out. Take a look at your resume. I mean, it's crazy. So as I'm packing up, I'm, you know, moving, I'm coming across all sorts of gems. I'm like, you did that? What was that? Like, you forget you've done so much in your life that it, it, it fades to the background. But I think it's really important to just sometimes drag out your resume or a couple of resumes, because you know how we revise them over the years and just read it and just get a sense of, wow, like this is the work that I've done. This is the impact I've had. It's really easy. It's a really quick um, way to do it. And so I just wanted to offer that as a tool. But I want to thank you both for um, uh, your feedback on that. That was really good. So, I'm thinking also, are there any pitfalls that you've experienced that you've been over, able to overcome as you, you know, 
went down the path of education, was there a point in your um, travels that made you think maybe, hey, am I doing this the right way? Do I need to reassess? Do I need to come up with a new approach? Um, have either one of you ever um, experienced any of those along the way? I think when we talked a couple weeks ago, um, after we all talked on the phone, I got off the um, the Zoom with you all and I called some some other educators and I'm like, I got off the most amazing conversation just now. And um, and I felt really good about it because I think something that uh, Zakia brought up in regards to just, are we doing the best for the scholars that we serve? And, you know, I think that I'm in that moment right now. I think that I'm experiencing that right now in my life with this idea of is any space best for black children? And um, that's kind of that um, conversation that we had a couple weeks ago. And that's been gnawing at me for the last two weeks since we had that conversation. And I think that, cause we talked about the private space. We talked about the, you know, um, the, 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 you know, secular spaces. We talked about the public spaces. We talked about all of these different um, places that we have our children in. And when we left that conversation, the question was, is any space, was it ever made for black children? And right. we ever make these spaces and create these spaces with black children in mind? And did we do the best we can to eradicate these systems, these uh, oppressive systems that we are working within? And mm -hmm. in the platforms that I'm sitting in, that Kia and everybody else, we all have a platform. We all have some level of of um, access and in these levels of privilege that we have right now, are we doing the best we can for the children we serve and really trying to figure out how we, you know, dismantle systems of oppression. And that's been gnawing at me for the last two weeks. And so I think that I am in that space right this second. Okay. All right, is that here? Yeah, I, I'm in that space and I'm back at work. We are preparing for children to come to school August 26th, and, um, and I am just in a space where I have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. And so when you have nothing to lose, mm -hmm. you, I, you, I'm just going all in. Mm -hmm. What is the most dynamic STEM class that I could possibly have? And to extend that to how many other children that are not in my class? Mm -hmm. Like... I'm just trying to, like, like, like Tamika saying, I'm getting ready to get creative on what it is. Um, so th I think if I remember your qu question correctly, like, so that's what's gnawing at me. Mm -hmm. How is it that in this particular environment that we're in, how do we monopolize? How do we, and that's where I am. And because I'm teaching STEM, um, I'm just trying to think, even though I'm in this grade level, how am I going to teach the students? So I think one of our missteps now in, in, in our public situation is that children are just supposed to be consuming what you give them. And my thing is, that's not, that, that's not even how I went to school. So like, mm -hmm. how am I going to help you eat some of this, but also help you feed others? So how is it that the children who are in my class are going to be able to go out and teach some other students so that then we can grow and we can create this environment? And that is part of, uh, somebody put in the chat, um, we need to create our own. Parents got to demand what they want. And we talked about last time, you know, it's no way that your child can be in a school and you don't start asking, where is the STEM program? And what are we doing? What, how is that, how is STEM impacting my child's learning? Otherwise, will my child be able to have their own business or be uh, working a job without that knowledge in the 21st century? How does that work? Exactly. I'm, I'm glad you touched on that because one of the things I was thinking about, so one of the pitfalls, it sounds like, you came across was the fact that you decided, you know, as an administrator who came back into the classroom that you needed to develop a coding program. And so you took it upon yourself to do that and to say, hey, here's an area, a very critical area that's not being addressed. And this is one of the things I'm gonna to do to make sure that 
this pitfall becomes a path forward for these students. And another thing I wanted to ask, I'm really clear that both of you are making sure these kids understand who they are and how to value themselves. And I think one of the other things that I'm concerned about is in other environments, our African-American and Latinx students and other children of color may not be really learning how to think critically. And so for me growing up, my parents made sure that my brother and I became critical thinkers. We couldn't just say, because, because what? You know, so then you had to really think about it and go deeper in it. It was exhausting, <laughs> it was exhausting, but I'm so grateful. So I'm just thinking, what would you recommend or how can we just think about those environments where our kids are not being taught? Cause you were just talking about them being consumers. And as a people here in this country, we're large consumers of many things. So how can we, um, and, and I don't know if this is the question that's gonna be answered here, but begin to think about how to move forward to make sure that our kids are not just consumers and they are creators and originators and they know that they have a brain and they can think for themselves. Um, from my perspective, I feel like um, the first thing that we have to do is recognize that that will not happen in a traditional school setting. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Right. Uh, and I don't care, you know, what position I have. Um, I recognize that there are systems in place and systemic concerns that will take decades and decades to, to get rid of. Um, and so we really have to take back our control in our homes. Right. Because what we are expecting the school to be able to give our children they're not, not, not that they're not equipped to do it, not that we don't have equipped people to do it, but the systems that are in place are so rigid to a point where it does not allow it to really take place. And mm -hmm. so if we're not already doing this in our homes prior to our children leaving our homes, it's very, um, we're just not going to meet the mark that we're looking for. Again, there are some schools that do a great job. I'm not saying that there's not some schools that try you know, I feel like my school, I feel like we do a great job with affirming our children. I feel like we do a great job with keeping things to, in an Afrocentric uh, perspective. I feel like we do a great job with some of those things, but I still feel like you are handcuffed in this system and that we need to be honest about that. So if we're looking for the school to do everything, it, it will not happen that way. Right, so before as I can speak, so I'm thinking more so, what can we offer to, um, to parents that they can do at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. if they're going to these schools where they're not getting it, is it, hey, here's a book your mm -hmm. kids should read over the summer. Make sure you give them a book report and teach them new vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, ask them to think differently out instead of, well, what happened in the book? Okay, yeah. well, the main character did so-and-so. Why do you think the character did that? I mean, just to go deeper. So that's, that's kind of what I'm um, heading yeah. to. And I, again, I agree with that again, I, but I think some of that is about our own literacy in our communities with our parents and that, what are we doing to actually equip parents to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that that goes deeper. I think that that um, goes into um, if we're going to give these resources, we also have to teach them how to utilize the resources and what to do with the resources. So mm -hmm. then we have to talk about what, you know, adult literacy looks like in our communities and and not necessarily going back to school, but it means, you know, do we have these learning hubs for our parents to understand what to do with children? Are we uh, given, uh, do we open up our spaces, whether it's the Reading Corner Cafe or whether it's a lot of- You already opened one up. So what yeah, do you- Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So even for me, am I opening up, you know, for my parents to come in and say, you know what, we're getting ready to start online learning with your scholars. I need you to come in and understand what to do with them while you're home. So that, because these are the things you're not necessarily going to get online, but these are the things you can do in addition as in, you know, to acceler accelerate them and prepare them. So again, keeping those things in mind and really being self-reflective. Are we doing all that we need to do? Yeah. Zarkia, would you like to chime in? Yeah, that's pretty loaded. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, it's some, I, I do agree that our parents can do and we can help them to learn to do things that will support our children in their learning. But I also believe it's true that 
how school is designed. And if we can redesign and now everybody has a laptop and everybody's in their house, we can redesign and have a say in what those systems, like t big systems have already been torn down in a blink of an eye. Yeah. So if, is it that we, that we empower parents to understand like, no, start asking my principal for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Start doing this because if we go online and all we're doing is what we did in the room, yeah. that's unfair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just totally unfair. When It's just unfair. I, I don't know what else to say to that. Um, when I think about um, a student in my class who has experienced tremendous trauma, and nobody in the world wants him to come in their room. He gonna get he gonna get kicked out. His mom don't doesn't know what to do. His mom got to go to work. When he can come in that STEM class and find success and then become the teacher, because one day he's showing off and he say, "Well, I'll just teach the class," and I'm like, "Yep, here we go." Mm -hmm. Then those kinds of environments have to be created for our children yep. and teachers have to be taught how to give them that type of autonomy mm -hmm. stop trying to run our kids brain and not allow them to think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so let me ask you this you know you just mentioned um the mental health piece and as a mental health therapist you know i'm very very big on all of us doing some counseling so what do you see happening in the educational system as it pertains to really helping kids with uh, mental health challenges and not just medicating them to death and really trying to get to the root of what's going on? Do you see that happening or do you see a different way forward? I'll start with um, Tamika. I do see, um, I think that we, we, push toward medication before we push toward services. And, um, and so I am seeing that services are available, but I also see the need for more. Um, I do see the need that there's not enough right now to even go around for the amount of trauma that we're dealing with in our communities. And so when our trauma is at a 10 and we're only given a three when it comes to services, then you're going to have seven do medicine because they don't have another option. And so for me, um, the thing about it is that I, you know, if you look at the, the statistics of black children and black boys, especially, and what that looks like in special education, what that looks like as far as medication, all of those things, it is a scapegoat. And, um, and we, you know, we have to call it for what it is. Um, there is not enough services going around. Um, there's not enough of the, you know, um, on the front end of it, we like to get on the back end of it. Like we like to be the cure instead of being the preventative measures. And yep. so there's not enough preventative pieces that are in place, even socio-emotional uh, programs at schools. You go to schools and they don't even have socio-emotional programs. Um, and so um, it's not mandated. And so at the end of the day, we're not preventing, we're trying to band-aid situations. And so I do think that we have the, we have the, the knowledge to do this. I just don't think that the services are um, robust enough. And let me just jump in here before as Ikea goes. So as a mental health therapist, I um, used to work as a lead clinician in the Feltonville Arts and Sciences School and Feltonville Intermediate. It was quite interesting because I would lead group therapy. I would do individual counseling. And it was very interesting to see um, how many kids were medicated, how many kids became zombies, how many kids could not stay awake. And so it's like, so is the answer just to have them check out? Because now they're not learning. Now they're not able to move forward. And you, if you're overly medicated, you can't even think clearly. So a lot of it was not wanting to deal with what the kids were going through. And, and to your point, to make it, it's a Band-Aid approach mm -hmm. and not understanding the importance of it. But what I also want to say that as a people, we're not the biggest proponents of mental health work and counseling. So once we see it as something important and something healthy and doesn't mean something wrong with you, studies have shown 
that stronger people, people who want to do the work are the ones that actually seek counseling. The ones that don't do the work that think they're strong are really the ones that are hiding. So once we say, hey, this is a part of the whole mind, body, spirit experience. This is how I deal with myself in a holistic way. Then we'll begin to see more forward movement. I'm sure then we'll say, hey, let's ask for more resources for this, but because it's critical. And anybody in this country who is African American, African Caribbean, straight from the continent is traumatized. That's right, that's right. And it's a stigma. So once we can get past the stigma of mental health and therapy and those things in our own homes, then we can actually, you know, see this in other places, so. Mm. Is that here? Did she freeze? I think she froze. Emma? Okay, oh, there, you are. there you are. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I am uh, currently in this training for to be a trauma-informed, for our school to be a trauma-informed school. And um, what I really walked away the other day with understanding was that if 80% of the teachers who teach our children in public education are Caucasian women, then all of them need this training. Just like you train on a reading program, you can't even get to the reading program if we don't get this degree of training. So being, being clear on how trauma presents itself and what are some options for how I engage children and what is literally happening to their brain development, if 70% if, if 70 of their brain development happens after they're, what, three years old or four years, whatever the young age is, then that means teachers who have most of their day, because the other part of the day they're asleep, we have to to look at this really different, differently and have the proper training so that we can really prepare ourselves and prepare our children for learning in these environments. I think the other thing is that cultural competency is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And that if you're gonna, these are the things, the things that I'm saying is the things that I believe parents have to start demanding. Yeah. If I'm a principal, you got to come to me with whatever, wh how vast your vocabulary is or not, and say that these are the things that I need so that my baby can start learning. Now, there again, you don't know what you don't know. But those that know need to tell the ones that don't know. Exactly. And y'all, they need to come and say, hey, this is what we need for our children. Because how are people keep, how do people get to keep teaching our children and they're not competent in the culture of the children yes yes and yes okay so now i have to say one more thing since you said that so currently um just finished my second mindfulness training and they were just granted a contract with the school district of philadelphia so that means that they're going to be doing mindfulness with most of our children right um and i talked about addressing trauma um, around COVID-19 and racial injustice, you know, um, injustice and what's happening here in our country. And the response that I got was essentially, you can't assume that everyone has been traumatized. And I was like, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm not assuming, I'm going to state it as a fact. Everyone has been traumatized around the world. COVID-19 and I think Raina froze. Yeah, the internet is really crazy these days. She's back. Are you back, Rana? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. <laughs> okay, I don't know what just happened. Maybe because I got fired up. Okay. <laughs> anyway, to me, it, it's not, you know when you know things are facts, so it's not, you don't get to have an opinion about it, it's factual. So in this case, this is something factual that this is what's happening and to not want to address it and say, I want to focus more on resiliency and not to want to confront things that are uncomfortable for you because you're white 
and these kids are of color, to me, that's a major, major problem. These are things that have to be addressed. And these are things that um, are essential. And for kids to come back into the classroom, whether virtually or in person, we have to address the trauma. We have to address it. We have to talk about what everyone is going through before we just throw them back into the classroom and start talking about science and math and English. It's not realistic. So I, I asked people to put um, questions in the chat and let me see if anyone has put anything in there because we go until seven and we can go longer than that, but we wanted to make sure we got some questions in. So let's see. I just see comments. So feel free if you have a question to put it into the chat. Okay, here's one. Do you find services are not being covered by insurance if medication is not included or is it our stigma or counseling from the community? Okay, I'll let, I'll let you guys answer. I, I know what I would say, but. I think it's both. I think it's the stigma and the counseling piece from the community um, because it, even before most people know that the insurance is not gonna pay for it, they already do not want to go in that direction. So I think the stigma is the bigger piece, but I think um, outside of that, most times our social workers in our schools and our counselors can, can lead you in the right direction to figure out the insurance pieces. Again, insurance doesn't do everything, but there's, there, it does do a lot that, um, that can be uh, utilized by our families. All you need is really um, someone to steer you in the right direction of how to how to maneuver the system and how to get around the system in order to get the benefits that you need. But I believe the stigma is what keeps us from doing that. Yes. What about you, Zakir? Um, I don't. I don't have enough. I, this is. I'm gonna say this is Zakir's thinking because I don't have enough data to support it. I think it depends on what insurance you have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, some of our state programming uh, that I have seen parents deal with in Pennsylvania and in Delaware, uh, if they had a particular uh, insurance, uh, they were very strongly urged to move in, in the direction of medication. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also say that the quality of service, I was, I can't remember the numbers, but I was really very shocked to, to find the numbers in single digits in the percent of African American doctors that they even had access to. So that's a whole nother thing that you come from a school where you're dealing with uh, not understanding and people being not culturally aware, and then you go to counseling and then there you have it, and then we're trying to get better. You know, so that that's just been my experience. Okay, I have another question. Have any of our educated educators devised a cultural based protocol that educates in a non judgmental anti racist way. Whoever would like to take that question. You're, you're talking like we can't hear you. No, oh, I was reading. I was okay, reading. okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Mm, I, I'm, I'm going to answer it uh, straight first. Uh, I think as far as a protocol, no. Are there things that as an individual and when, uh, because of how I function, because of how I believe when I have to deal with my staff, yes, there is a process and a procedure that I might, I might do myself. But uh, that question is really powerful and uh, it has given me something to walk away. I'm gonna even save the chat so that I can come back to that because that that's that's a good one. Yeah, I definitely think this is something that um, I had a phone call this morning, a Zoom conference this morning, and um, and the discussion was around anti-racist uh, practices and you know again how are we coming back to um, a school? How are we bringing our children back? How are we addressing trauma? Um, so we are having some conversations around that. So I agree. There's not necessarily a framework that actually just 
says this is what you need to do. But I definitely agree that um, people are now, um, the conversation is at the table. And there's real dialogue being, um, uh, being had around this topic of, you know, these systems and how do we dismantle Because Because again, this whole system needs to be dismantled. Um, and um, we can't, Right now, we're like picking and choosing what things we want to do to make right. And it's kind of like trying to make these wrongs right. But this entire system needs to be turned upside down on its head. And, um, and so we have to have real serious conversations about that. So I don't think that there's this, this platform or this, um, uh, I guess, uh, framework right now. But I do think that the conversations are happening. And we need to use this time right now because if no other time, we have the opportunity right now to make some systemic changes that we did not have previous to COVID and previous to us going online. As you said earlier, if we come back and start teaching the same way we did when we were in a brick and mortar, we're doing a disservice to our children. So we finally have this opportunity and we have to seize the moment right now. Okay. All right. That's, that's amazing too, because actually that's what Kim is working on today. Yay, good, good. All right, so here's one that I thought, I talk about this all the time, and um, I wish that I had this when I was going to school. And I just want to hone in on the money and finances in terms of teaching kids how to save, how to invest, starting very young, and just wondering how that is being addressed in schools or if it isn't. Is it something that uh, the two of you would want to make sure that your schools are addressing? What would you say? Financial literacy is um, is so important. Uh, so for our school, we have had um, some outside consultants to come in and do some financial literacy pieces with our children. Um, mm -hmm. It should be a part of curriculum, and it's not. Um, it should be a part of the mandated curriculum, and it's not. Uh, but we have had and we have, um, you know, had outside sources to come in and do this. And so, which has been beneficial, but again, it's not school wide. So um, in regards to just trying to make sure that our scholars, by the time they get our age, that they have made great decisions financially, that they understand what business, have a business mindset, that they can do what they need to do and be successful, I think is about us really looking at curriculum and really um, mandating what that looks like. I totally agree. Is that clear? Um, I was reading again, so help me. All right. Financial literacy. Financial literacy. Yeah. Um, I have not, um, in recent years, it was a really big thing when I was a math teacher for me, I had designed a lesson around it. Like it was like a part of my uh, curriculum. I just had to, and that was with middle schoolers, just how I, I called it how you live it. And um, we had to do that. But at, like Mika said, in, in, in school, it, it's going to have to be a part of how they live, like in school, like learning it. But um, as of right now, the schools that I've work in, worked in currently, that is not something that we, we have put in the forefront. Okay. So I think that would be something that would be great to do um, just because we're so used to surviving, we don't even understand the path to thriving. And so check to check, you know, just teaching kids very young how to just do some very basic things will go a long way in terms of how they learn to manage money, how they learn to value money, how they learn to not just be consumers, but also investors and to even save money maybe to grow a business or start a business as a young person and continue to do that so uh, i'm really excited that someone asked that question yeah what well, i don't know but i i would like to put this out here last year uh dr Boyce watkins i think his name is mm -hmm. was speaker for we by black when the conference was or maybe it was the year before last but anyway in atlanta um but he has really put uh, even a school together, very inexpensive for uh, folks who may want to uh, look into him uh, for young people and of age. But uh, I just started recently uh, listening to some of his pieces on YouTube uh, and his name, I'll put his name in the chat. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he, he was a professor at uh, Syracuse and after dealing with so much racism decided to create his own school and his goal I think was to have a hundred thousand students or something like that and he's like at 900 some 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 wow. uh, it, uh, because he want his thing is that we have to create generational wealth to get out of this thing and here's these quick some of them are free some of them I'm, his schooling stuff is not but like he's out there somebody already wrote it in the chat Boyce Watkins, Dr. Boyce Watkins, and somebody just put in the, the blackbusinessschool.com. Okay, excellent. Very good. So there's a question here. It kind of goes to what you just said about Dr. Uh, Watkins. Can we create our own black micro schools, then grow them to create our own national school system? What do you think about that? I, I tried it. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm uh, ready. Excited. I'm ready. Tell me where you uh, need me to be, and I will be there. Okay. Um, if if anybody wants to start, what I am, I totally agree. Um, another uh, person. Um, her name is Ashley Fox, and she does something called Empify. And Ashley uh, goes in schools and does the same thing in regards to um, the financial literacy and pieces like that. And honestly, if we could take these small entities right. such as this and help create our own schools and our own places and our own services and teach our own children, um, we we would definitely uh, be at a different place. Uh, but so so I I am I'm excited about that idea. Okay, so now here's a, a charged question. What do you think about the fight between charter slash private school systems versus public school systems and the relationship between teachers within those separate systems? Mm -hmm. mm. Uh -huh. So I'm a, I'm a charter school uh, CEO. I am, but I'm also a, um, I am, I came from the school district of Philadelphia. I was a, you know, administrator and a teacher in the uh, traditional public school. Please recognize that public and charter are both public. Um, mm -hmm. One is a traditional public. One is a, you know, has a little more autonomy. Right. And in all honesty, I, though I am a CEO of a charter school, I am not pro-charter, I'm not pro-public, traditional, I'm pro-children. And I believe that um, that parents should have choice, that if, they're, if they would like their children to go to certain places, they should have that right. Um, this, like, this idea of fighting amongst ourselves in regards to um, which sector you're from, I think has, has really tainted the educational pool, period. Um, we do more fighting and infighting than we do educating. And so we spend a lot of time having this conversation about charter versus public versus, you know, uh, Catholic versus, you know, um, Islamic school. We do a lot of infighting, but we don't do enough educating. And I think that at the end of the day, parents, I have children of my own. I am a product of a public school. I believe in them. I believe that every school and every corner should have a, a thriving school at the corner of every block. But the problem is that in our city, and I'm only speaking from ours, in our city, the problem is that we have more failing schools than we have thriving schools. And when you have a situation that looks like that and the triangle is upside down, then parents got to make choices. And parents make choices with their feet. They either walk in a school or they walk out of a school. And so when they make that choice, they say, you know what, I'm going to send mines here because I know that my child will thrive here. And so they should have that choice. At the end of the day, it's not for the school district or for federal government to tell us what to do with our children. It's for us in our homes to decide what's best for our children. And so for me, I think that it's less about the fight and more about what is parent choice and why are they choosing what they're choosing. So Tamika, to that point, what do you think about the woman who was arrested? And I don't know if she served like five years because she used a different address so that her child could go to a better school. The black woman. Yes, of course. Of course. Yes, of course. I mean, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought that was assumed. Yeah. So like, what do you think about that? Where people have to actually lie about where they reside so their child can get a good education. And this goes back to, again, a systemic concern, because keep in mind that Philadelphia is one of the few cities left that still make you go within your zip code. So your neighborhood school is where you have to go. So if you live in a poorer district or a poorer neighborhood, then you go to a uh, less um, less affluent school. You live in a more affluent neighborhood, you go to a more affluent school. And so when we think about that, it is set up for failure. It is set up to keep 
certain people, certain places, oh, yes. and other people, other places. And so when you have someone who feels like they have to lie on an application, it is because they want what's best for their child. They want their child to, but in all honesty, I wish she didn't have to. I wish the options in her community was okay. Because at the end of the day, when I think about my child who I pay for to have an education, I would love for him to go somewhere that was free. I would love for him to get a free and appropriate education in his neighborhood. I would love to be able to say that the children that we serve don't have to get on a bus and go somewhere two hours away or get on a bus at six in the morning to get to school by eight o'clock in the morning. It is so unfortunate and it's a disservice to children. And so, but again, we're making decisions and we're trying to stand in a gap for our children because of the system and how it's set up. So it's totally unfair. Okay, thank you. Zakia? Um, yeah, the, uh, it is a, it's a disgrace, number one, for our children. Just listen to this. Our children, in order to, what their parents think to get a better education, has to go through a lottery to get an education. A lottery? I've had this conversation with fifth and sixth graders. Mm -hmm. you, you, your, hand, your, your name went in a hat, mm -hmm. and that's why you get to go here. That was for us. And so whether you went to the public school or the public charter school, it's all a gamble. Mm -hmm. And then I think I said this a, a, a couple of weeks ago. Who is it that you have decided to give your child's mind to mm -hmm. for them to pour into it what they like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And how many of them going to get a principal like me or Mika? And I'm not a principal right now. Mm -hmm. But you're still leading. I am. I'm, uh, trust me. Watch right. what happened with this STEM class. That's right. That's right. I'm absolutely clear on that. Right. I'm where I need to be. Yeah. I'm where I need to be. But I. I but, but just to your point about mm -hmm. charter, mm -hmm. private, parents struggling as private. Like yep. you got to detox your baby when you come back. My mother had to do the same thing. Yep, that's right. I went to school with all of these Caucasian children and these Caucasian teachers. And although I have learned to think outside of the box, I had to learn to defend myself while I'm in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. All parents right now are struggling just about the development of their children's mind, which is a God given right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, it, it's, it's utterly ridiculous. But somebody asked the question, I want, want to. Um, Pose to you. Can anyone explain why you have to teach someone to be anti-racist? Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? Mm -hmm. Say that again. Can you explain why you have to teach someone to be anti-racist? Isn't that counterintuitive? So I will say this. Um, so I'm I'm in the middle of reading a book right now, and um, and the book has challenged me because uh, one of the things it talks about in regards to this idea of a, being an anti-racist. Um, even as a black person, it's challenged me because again, as a principal of a school, I have to really say to myself, you know, um, the policies that I have in my handbook, are they oppressive policies? And maybe I didn't look at it like that because as black people, we believe that we're doing the best that we can for them and that it's about only white people. But honestly, we have been bamboozled in a lot of ways. And because of that, and because we've been traumatized and because we've been, you know, um, our minds have been just whatever's been done with them, um, then we also are perpetuating some of these same systems. And so that idea of teaching how to be anti-racist, I don't know about necessarily the teaching of it, but I know that it is making you, it's making some people more reflective of practices. And when you start getting reflective of your practices, you have to ask yourself, you know what, in the position that I hold, is my code of conduct um, 
criminalizing black boys in my school because I am saying that you can't get this until you get this. Your uniform changes when you get this or when you do this, that I'm telling you that you have to have grit because you have to get here. And you know, all of the things that come along with those things. So when we start thinking about anti-racist, it's not just about white people. It is about us really being self-reflective of whether or not we are perpetuating the same systemic concerns of you know white supremacy within our own um, what we do in our schools. So I think that it's just it's allowing me to be self-reflective right now. I love it. I love it. And would you like to share the name of the book or? Yeah, it's called How to Be an Anti-Racist. It's, it's actually um, written by. Okay, all right. So yes. And um, we're also uh, reading Bettina Love's book right now as well. And so, um, and I'll put that in the chat as well, but I'm reading a couple books right now that we're working on with our staff for professional development purposes. So um, that's been pretty good. Okay, so How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibrahim Kendi, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Zakia, what would you like to say? I think I'm, I'm going, I don't have something to say about that. Oh, okay. All right, great. So let's see if we can find another question. I saw one. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, I have to go all the way back up. It was one, I, and I think that's why I said I didn't want to ask the question because someone I was reading their question. Um, they asked about. Um, they somebody had asked about what we thought about uh, trade. It was a question that came from Facebook about. Okay you know, what were the thoughts? I was trying to find it. Oh, it said, uh, we should establish schools that teach the trades also, like they used to do in the public schools, especially the predominantly Caucasian schools, junior high and high school level. What are your brilliant educators' thoughts on that? And, uh, I, and that's what I was thinking about and why I said I couldn't. I wasn't that I couldn't, I was thinking about that. Um, and actually, I think because children are dynamic and their brain, all of their brains are different, we have to do all of that. We have to teach them trades. We have to have artists. We have to have scientists. We have to, and the environment has to be conducive where you can just learn what you what 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 you learn. So for me. Um, bringing that back into our schooling, I think is really paramount. And really, especially going into the age of this technology and where we are right now, we have to. I totally agree. I, I want to say something here. Someone is asking about, do we need quality childcare for our children? And as an early interventionist who works with zero to three-year-olds, I go into lots of homes and daycare centers. And what I can say, is that they are also not equally created. I have toddlers who can barely say their name. Well, that's kind of normal, but you know, working on their letters and color recognition and shape recognition. And then I go to another daycare center, which is part of a synagogue, and these kids are learning about uh, the galaxy at the same age. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, how is this happening? And it's happening. And you know that zero to three, those are the years when things are really kicking in. And if you don't get it then, then that takes you no matter what, you can be in the same class as someone else who already got what they needed in those first three years. And it takes you behind the curve by years. So that's, I mean, I didn't, I hadn't even thought about this, but I'd like you guys to talk about that because from the level from uh, what you're teaching, you're getting them a little later on. I'd, I'd like us to talk about zero to three, three to five, like when this is really, really critical for them to even be able to stay on top of things. So who wants to talk about that? You wanna start, Takia? Oh, sure. Um, you know, uh, you, you spoke about it uh, our last session about the, uh, the Harlem Children's Zone, did I say it right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, that's another format that we, how do we get started and start to developing like that in our communities, right? Because if, 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 if we're not thinking about what they need prior to getting to us, then we, we, we're gonna function at it. We're gonna continuously function at a deficit, mm -hmm. right? So, um, 
as I think about uh, implementing STEM, and I'm gonna just put it out here, my thinking is, okay, if I'm in the middle school and I'm teaching it, then how am I getting ready to branch down to kindergarten? Because yeah. I know those kindergartners already knowing what the fifth and sixth graders know by the time they get to me. Mm -hmm. And what am I going to do about mer bridging that gap for the children who leave eighth grade going up to high school? Mm -hmm. so I need to know what's happening at high school to backwards. And so I think that that in, it, in effect is what has to happen as if I don't, I'm not as, I don't have as much experience in early childhood. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I just know about the impact of when they get to where I am. Okay. You know, you know what I want to say about that? Because I do a lot of STEM activities with my, with my toddlers. And they are brilliant. And they pick up on things very easily. It's just like how they recommend that, you know, when kids are younger, they can more easily become bilingual. When they're younger, the brains are more open and not all the filters and, you know, doubts and whatever else, distractions. But these two uh one and a half and two year olds and i'm working with oh they are loving these stem activities and they are all up on it so they're never too young so i just wanted to uh, mention that mm -hmm. tamika did you want to say something yeah, um i just think that um i know everybody has kind of heard of the that million word um gap uh study uh as far as if children are not read to at home before they even enter mm -hmm. kindergarten they're already a million words behind uh mm -hmm. their counterpart and so when we think about that zero to three years old the real question becomes what type of a daycare center are you sending them to? Because are you sending them to one that just plays games and let's color and let's A, B, and C? Or are you sending them to one that actually is reading to them on a daily basis? Making sure that they're hearing words on a daily basis. The literacy is uh, evident on what they're do in what they're doing. Uh, allowing them to have the fine motor skills and work on certain things. Um, so. Again, I think it's just about parents really investigating what it is that their children will be learning while in that zero to three, because if they're not coming kindergarten ready, they're already behind. Mm -hmm. And so if they're five years old and they're not kindergarten ready, you're already behind the eight ball. And it takes a lot to get them kindergarten ready by the time they get to kindergarten. So you're already trying to work within a deficit. Mm -hmm. I want to say one more thing about that. So largely in our community what i've seen is that we are not really um aware all the time of how critical it is to make sure that they're going to pre-k and mm -hmm. kindergarten and doing all those things because i've seen quite a few parents who just keep their kids at home mm -hmm. and they some parents are actually doing the work at home so they're homeschooling them getting them ready to enter into you know i guess early academia but then there are those who are just allowing the kids just to play they play, they eat, they sleep, but they are not understanding the importance of doing all of that work to get them ready to be on task and to be on time and not delayed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Did you, see Did you guys see another question? Uh, what say, uh, uh, what, so, what do you say to a parent that says my child is too young to learn about finance? How do you demonstrate uh, to them the importance of teaching more complex concepts mm -hmm. at a young age? The, the smallest things, even at a young age, um, teaches about finance. So, you know, um, reminding them about, you know, talking about allowance, talking about small things will teach them uh, what it means. Uh, right now, I, this is the first year that I, um, I have like these um, children's credit cards for my children this year. Um, and so uh, Jordan knows when it gets to a certain amount that that means you can't purchase anything else on it. And uh, so again, I am uploading, I'm putting the money on. So it's just kind of like a debit card, but it's, it's actually, it, it was actually put in place to teach children how to be financially literate. And right. so, um, so I, I purchased it this year, or I got it this year for both of my children. And I was like, oh, Jordan's too young for this or whatever. And then I'm like, no, let me go ahead and do it. And she will tell me, mom, I only have $5 and 40 cents left on here. I can't buy this. And those conversations will lead to how are you budgeting your money? Did, how much did you spend this week? Do you remember what you did with this? Um, so no, I don't think that children are too young for any of those type of lessons, but I do think that we can start just in the small things, going to the store, every time you go to the store, and now we're so used to swiping our cards that our children don't see us use 
coins. They don't see us use dollars. Uh, so you don't have conversations about that. But that idea of how much change does mommy get back? How much change does daddy get back? Um, those things are really important in conversations with children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, agree. I, I wanted to just say with that, something even simpler for the younger one. So like, I love what Tamika's talking about. I'm not sure if that's the debit card that Will Smith and someone else started together for young people. Um, but even having a bank, just a little bank and have the little toddlers put the coins in. So they get into the habit of that. And then you name the coin. So that's how they learn, you know, the denominations. And then maybe at some point you take them out and you count them together and they understand, oh, this adds up to 25, this adds up to, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, Tamika, you're that's, absolutely right. That, 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 that to the bank trip, every time the piggy bank gets full, is the best thing in the world. They dump it inside the coin machine and the coin machine counts it for them. And they're like, oh, I saved this much money. And so that became like a, a thing. Like once a month, let's go to TD Bank. Let's dump our coins. Let's get the mm -hmm. bank to do the little thing. So all of those become conversations around literacy, I think, financial literacy. Zaki, did you want to comment or you just read the question? I just read the question. Okay, so somebody said psychology of commerce, start with household chores. Mm -hmm. um, and here I thought this was very interesting, but not surprising. I'm a public school teacher. I teach personal finance in high school. Most students don't even know how much money their parents make, nor where the money goes monthly, weekly, etc. That's right. That's right. So budgeting. They just, they just believe it appears. It appears. It's just supposed to be there. It's a money tree. There's yeah. a magic money it's tree. supposed to be there. I didn't know how much my mother made or did that either. But at the same time, to your point, Mika, I did have allowance where right. I had to make sure that I paid charity. I right, had to right, 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 right. So it is true that uh, it's a lot of work that is being placed on teachers mm -hmm. uh, to help our children get ready for life. Mm -hmm. That's that's the facts of what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And um, our society plays into that because there's so much going on in the world from working to all the other things that have just, just bombarded us that family life has shifted as we know it. Right. You know, and so. Definitely. So wait, you just, you're, you're the best with that, with your segues. Okay, so Zakia. Yes. Someone said, what are we doing to influence our people um, during the pandemic to change to homeschooling and create an economic base? Because there are, I have uh, clients who are definitely homeschooling instead of sending their kids, you know, in turn, you know, alternate days. And that's more so daycare because we know the Philadelphia school system is virtual until November. Yeah. Um, they said, what are we doing to get our families to do what? In terms of homeschooling. So to change to homeschooling instead of. There. Everybody just to homeschool. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that somebody made that comment and it's not for everybody mm -hmm. right? you're already in the house with your children and, and, and right I'm trying to figure out how to be entertaining and at the same like and when I say entertaining how to keep their attention through mm -hmm. the medium and get the work done and get them still being able to think on their own and do so I don't know that for for every parent, is that a thing, right? Like to, to homeschool your children. I did see somebody say like, hey, we do need to make sure that parent, oh, it was Mika that was saying that, that we got to figure out how we're going to support our families who, right. who need to like understand how this is working and to ensure that their children are working because working at home is a different beast. So I don't know, like homeschool, um, Yeah, that, that that's a, I, I'm gonna stop right there because starting businesses and uh, and getting uh, parents to do that with their children or with their families. Um. Okay, so wait, I have one that's gonna excite both of you. Mm -hmm. um, oh wait, so Reg, I guess Man Manuel or Emmanuel said, I bet you these teachers got a these parents got a good long taste of what teachers go through in school since their children have been home with them. I heard a few parents say, give teachers a pay raise. What would you like to say about that? Yeah, I've seen that. administrator. I say, definitely, definitely. I say. I say, I say. 
<laughs> it, it, it is a difference when you, I think, as a parent are home with your scholar to, uh, your child 24 hours a day. Um, it is a, uh, you do see some things when you're trying to get them to sit down and actually concentrate and listen to what's going on on a computer and they're up and they're bouncing and they're doing all these other things. And you're like, oh my God, this is what your teacher has to deal with all day. And you're trying to, you know, get some things through. Because the other thing to keep in mind is that there's a difference between homeschooling and virtual learning. And they're right. not the same thing. Right. Exactly. You got to be honest that some people are not built for homeschooling because homeschooling is tough. And mm -hmm. then there is the virtual learning piece where you actually have somebody, you know, um, that is there. And so we just got to uh, keep in mind that there are two different um, avenues for that. And then some people do really well in it. But I definitely agree with this idea that uh, educators are becoming essential now. We wasn't essential before. Now we're essential. So um, and that they deserve a raise and that they definitely deserve to be paid their worth. I definitely agree with that. So, um, Zaki, I'll start with you. What do you think about in terms of, um, so there are some schools. So for example, my cousin teaches at a private school. And so now they're giving the kids even more work to justify um, the tuition. And the kids are stressed out, like it's too much. And this, these kids are in like third grade or something. So what do you say about how your schools are handling this, especially in the virtual space now? Are you giving them the same amount of work? Are you doubling up on the work? Are you cutting back on the work? How are you helping the kids to stay sane and the parents? We were talking about this a little earlier. I have been on Zoom all day since eight o'clock this morning. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a child trying to think and even me like how many times did I just tell you like in our world of Kip a child wouldn't have necessarily been able to tell me that hey I can't answer that right now because I was reading that chat over there mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm looking for a hundred percent of hands raised yeah. I, like they have some deep concepts right like that that'll break the brain down right so I think um It's hard. It's just hard. It's like we just learning. We just we don't like some stuff we know and some stuff we don't know. And um, I just um, so yeah. is, your, is your school giving more work, or do you guys plan to do? More? Will, thank you for bringing right. that. Up. Right. Yeah. So they are. So what our what our school is done as and they're kind of modeling what we, they're really expecting for children, which is we're on. We have a break. We're on. We have a break. Mm -hmm. um, don't start at seven o'clock in the morning, seven thirty, like we did when we were in the building. Right. Um, we start at eight o'clock, and 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 they kind of walked us into that, right? We started out at nine o'clock at first, and was getting out and being done at one o'clock. But today we stretch till three thirty. So so it's like a gradual process. So that's what we'll probably do with the children, right? Like it's mm -hmm. not like their first two weeks. It just kind of be like kind of orientation kind of stuff, getting acclimated. How do you use Zoom? How do you do these things? Right. Um, their day is no way for their day. And KIPP students used to, uh, are, are, they, they, they pride themselves. We pride ourselves in long days. Mm -hmm. And still the results wasn't 80%, like I keep telling you I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Now we're talking about a, probably a shorter day, right? Mm -hmm. So, and constant contact with their parents mm -hmm. and like me reaching out to your your child when they're not there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And then uh, following up with your parents, like you and your parents, since this is middle school. So I think the day won't be as long. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tamika. Same thing. Uh, we're doing um, a we're doing synchronous and asynchronous learning. So we're doing times where teachers are face to face with scholars um, for pretty much majority of the day. But we're doing breaks as well. Uh, we're keeping in mind uh, this idea of screen time and how much is age appropriate and how much is not age appropriate for them to be on the screen for nine hours of the day. Um, as so, we are doing breaks in between. We're also doing a lot more small group instruction and a lot more conference times in between. Um, because we're talking about what it means to have a certain amount of touches each day from different staff members. So a touch from this teacher, a touch from that teacher, um, a touch from to your parents. So a lot more of that 
but we are going until about, I would say instruction is taking place till about one each day. And then after that is conference time and small group instruction in the afternoon. Uh, but for the most part, it is some breaks in between. And again, that's a level of responsibility as well, because if you say it's a 15 minute break, scholars got to come back in 15 minutes. So um, that level of responsibility and, you know, do you know when to come back? Are you ready to come back? You know, making sure that they don't show up to one class and not show up to the rest of the classes. So again, because some parents are actually working. Um, so we're, we're doing the same thing. We're not trying to um, overcompensate, but I will say this. One thing that, that this has allowed us to do is be more innovative. So we're able to do things now with our schedule that we were not able to do when we were in the building. So it's allowing us to be more creative, more innovative, and do some things that are actually scholar-centered, that are them choosing what things they would like to do. So going back to the idea of shop classes and you know uh, things that children used to just love doing, we are able to be more creative with our schedule now that we are online and children can pop into this room and pop into that room versus being so um, strict about what your day and what your schedule looks like while you're in a brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. Excellent, okay. So before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you guys four questions. So rapid fire to quick, quick. All right. So I, I'm going to go back and forth because I don't want you to have too much time to think. Okay. So I'm going to ask Zakia and she answers it. I'm going to go to Tamika. Okay. okay. All right. Zakia, just so that everyone listening gets to know a little bit more about you, the person Zakia outside of the educator with your hat on. All right, your favorite food? Fish. Tamika? Potatoes. Zakia, book you're reading now? Um, teacher's Code. Tamika, book you're reading now? I gave you all my book earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Bettina Love and um, How to Be a uh, Anti-Racist. Those are my two books right now. And Trevor okay. Noah, Trevor Noah. <laughs> oh yes, most definitely. I'm a big audible person. Yeah, and I, me too. I shouldn't tell educators that, but yeah, I listen to audible. Yes, yes. All right, so Zakia, favorite pastime? Hmm, going to DC. Okay. Tamika? I would say, whew, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's what I said. I was like, no. Oh, do I have a pastime? Oh, Lord. Um, I guess just spending time with my family. I love that. I knew she was going to say that. I was going to answer for you. I was like, Tamika, if you don't have an answer, I have an answer for yeah, you. Yeah, spending time with my family because I don't have any other past times. <laughs> All right. Last question for both of you, Zakia. Last place you traveled before COVID-19? Hmm. Domestically or internationally? India. Okay. Hmm. Tamika, last place you traveled before COVID-19? Um, probably Bahamas. Nice. Oh, yeah, I wasn't in it. I, was <laughs> I know, I know. I did a lot of traveling before COVID-19. Right? It's like a thing in the past, man. A year ago, we went to the uh, DR, yeah, I remember. But you, you know what's interesting? Just traveling a lot and you take it for granted, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I traveled because the world has changed in terms yes, of- Yes, yes. I said this uh, just last week to someone, I said, I have not gotten my passport stamped at all this year. Like, you know, but you take it for granted because I'm so used to traveling so much that it's like, oh my goodness, it didn't get stamped at all. Well, I want to thank you both for being outstanding panelists and um, just for being who you are as women, as educators, and those who are understanding the importance of being of service to others. Um, that is really, really critical. And I just thank God that your families raised you to know who you are and to do the work that you do and to love it. So I'm going to say goodbye. I'm Rhonda Walker. Thank you for joining us tonight on Let's Chat Education Part 2, which is a part of New Africa August Conference. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Be well. well thank you. Have a good night. Rhonda, you did an awesome job too. Yep, yep. Wonderful moderator. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, ladies. Um, I, still, I think we're still live, Kathy. I think it's still live. Yes, I know. I want to give an announcement for tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. Tomorrow we have two speakers. We have a Mr. Kenneth Fields.
He's going to be talking about the ERP and doing be business better. And we also will have Mr. Jermaine Minerva. And he's going to talk about staying in business. So make sure you join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. Same link, same channel. And good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.